Hey, welcome everybody. My name is John Clay, VP of Threat Intelligence here at Trend Micro. And welcome to my monthly threat webinar series. This is April, 2023. Uh, and I'm gonna be covering my cyber risk index. Uh, interesting enough, I've been um, going to a number of the world tour cities. Trend Micro has been doing a global world tour city. We're gonna hit about 120 plus cities around the world. And we're talking risk to resilience. And I started the Cyber Risk Index about five years ago. Um, I'll talk about a little in the next couple of slides how it works, but I uh, wanted to start talking risk. We, uh, we understood that risk is a big uh, topic within a lot of organizations. So I created this. This is a qualitative uh, survey. It's done through sur a survey process. But uh, what's interesting is in our world tour, we're talking about our Vision One Risk Insights, which is actually a quantitative approach at looking at your devices, your accounts, all of the things that are happening, your attack surfaces, and we give you a risk score there as well. So uh, it's a nice uh, combination where you can get a quantitative risk score through Trend Micro's uh, Vision One within your in, your or organization, or you could do it through the Cyber Risk Index, which is a qualitative approach. So how it works, um, it is a risk index that is created from two different uh, portions of a survey. Uh, I, I did this with the Pontiman Institute. Like I said, I started this five years ago. And um, how, it, how it sets up and how the scoring works is there's two indices. There's a, the, on the lower left, you see Cyber Preparedness Index. This is done through a series of about 36 questions that we ask uh, the the uh, surveyees about their business. Um, so we look at people, process, and technology, uh, and we ask questions around those three areas. Uh, and then we also have a separate, a second section of the survey that goes into the threat landscape, and that's the cyber threat index. So we ask a number of questions there as well, and and then we create the index uh, by taking the preparedness index and subtracting. Uh, the th threat index from it, and that gives us a, a score. And the score you can see in the top uh, thing ranges from minus 10, which is the highest risk you can have, to plus 10, which is the lowest risk you can have, and in between. So you have high risk, elevated risk, moderate risk, and low risk. Uh, and so we we base it on that. In this round, you can see here, we, uh, we this is a global survey. Um, I started out doing North America only for the first couple of years, but then we added in these global countries to try to get a better global view of, of what the uh, cyber risk looks like. And you can see here, um, our final sampling, we had over 3,729 3, surveys that were, were done out of 4,000 that were returned. We had, we rejected 326. But you can see the breakdown, North America, and these are the regional breakdowns that I do. Also, I, I deliver as part of this uh, publicly is the North America, Europe, APAC, Aegean, and Latin America, South America countries. And you can see all the countries represented. We have 20, 29 countries represented in the, uh, in the index. So we get a very good sampling of what's happening out there and around the world. So... Um, we the other thing we try to do is we 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 focus on um, we we cover small business, medium sized business, and large business, and it's about a third, a third, and a third uh, in the uh, in the survey. So and then a wide range of of industries obviously are also representative. Although I don't have those breakdowns uh, for you today, but um, the nice thing that I wanted to to share is first is we're in the moderate. Um, range now. This is the first time I've ever seen the index come into the global index come into the moderate range, which is a plus 0 0.01. And again, we we do we do do use the uh, uh, two digit um, uh, to make sure it's as granular as possible. But uh, but that's good news for everybody. So it just means that you know we've gone from elevated in the past up to a positive one. And here's the breakdown. If you want to look at the upper right corner, you can see this is the global cyber risk index uh, scores over the last several years. So in 2020, it was minus 0.41. And in the first half of 21, it was minus 0.42. So it dropped a little bit, uh, but then it increased better up to minus 0. Uh, 0 0.04. And then the first half of last year, it was minus 0.15. But in the second half, and that's what I'm covering today is our second half 
uh, results is plus 0 0.01. So again, it, it moved up into that into that range. On the left-hand side, you can see a couple of things that I wanted to share. This just looks at um, the first half of 22 versus the second half of 22, and you can see it went um, some higher risk, lower risks, and things like that. And on the right side, you see you can see they break down the trend line from uh, for all regions. It was minus, um, uh, or excuse me, North America. It was minus 1.27, and then it went up to uh, minus 0 0.01, and so forth. But you can see the trending line. So it has been a little bit erratic. It goes up and down and up, which is typical of most surveys. Um, the nice thing is we do the same surveys every, or the same questions every time. So we keep that pretty consistent. We did add a few um, ones in the last couple of rounds, just because obviously as technology changes and the attack surface changes, we want to uh, uh, make sure we cover those as well. Now, if we want to look at the top cyber preparedness, and this comes from the, the, the 36 questions, you can see that the, the lower the score, the higher the risk for the preparedness one. Um, so the lowest, uh, um, the highest risk question was my organization's IT security function has the ability to know the physical location of business critical data assets. So obviously people are struggling to identify their entire attack surface. They can't, they, they, they struggle identifying the physical location of their business critical data assets. Um, so that's something that needs to be addressed in the future for a lot of organizations. The second one is my organization's senior leadership views security as a competitive advantage. This is something we've seen over the years where um, cybersecurity, that component of, the, of a business's um, uh, process there, sometimes doesn't get the view from the C section, uh, the C levels or the executives uh, within the organization don't recognize that cybersecurity should be a fundamental part of their overall organization uh, business uh, processes. Uh, you look at uh, the third one, my organization's IT security function has the ability to unleash countermeasures such as honeypots to gain intelligence about the attacker. This is an interesting one. Um, obviously, it's uh, they put it as a high risk because they don't have the ability to do this. Um, but again, this is where this is the hack back type of process. We may not always recommend hack backing, uh, but certainly there's some uh, opportunity to do honey pots or something um, that you can put in place that might help you understand who's targeting you, where they're targeting you. And more importantly, how they're targeting you if you have those honey pots in place. Um, the fifth one, uh, fourth one here is my organization's CEO and board of directors are actively involved in overseeing the IT security function. Again, I think this is improving, um, uh, which is good news because you know this number was lower in the past um, because uh, but but organizations are understanding and their boards are, are are starting to understand that cybersecurity is a key component to to their risk. Um, uh, of the of the business. So the more they can get involved in that, the better off as an organization you'll be. And then the last one um, is my organization's IT security architecture has high interoperability, scalability, and agility. And this goes again back to the, the thing, and we talk about this in our in our uh, uh, city tours, that today, if you think about a lot of the, the uh, threat um, security products are siloed. So they, you have probably have multiple vendors in your organizations. Their products are all running in your in your businesses, but they tend to be siloed. They aren't interoperable in many cases. There's a there, it's difficult to scale some of them. So that can be a definitely a, a high risk, which is uh, which is what the surveys mentioned here. So they felt that uh, if there was a way to improve that, it would be um, better for their organization. We get into the this is gets in, gets into the threat index area. Um, we ask these three questions: how how many separate data breach incidences involving the loss or theft of customer records did you have in the past twelve months? And you see, eighty one percent. This is global. Eighty one percent had one or more data breaches. Twenty nine percent had seven or more. Again, this is excuse me. This is critical data. That's your customer records getting breached. Um, in the, the second one is how many separate data breaches that involve um, information assets or IP, your intellectual property uh, that, you're, that you had. And you see 84% had one or more of those and 32% had seven or more. 
And then the last question is how many separate cyber attacks that infiltrated your organization's networks did you experience in the last 12 months? So these are basic cyber attacks. May not involve a breach of, of critical data like your customer records or your IP, but if you just happen to have it. Maybe it was a, a phishing attack that was successful or maybe a ransomware attack that was successful, but 85% had one or more attacks and 33% had seven or more. So, so obviously organizations are still struggling, even though we're in the moderate range of the overall cyber risk, um, that um, this shows that the threat the threat still is is going um, pretty poorly and, and being able to detect some of these attacks inside your organization if almost you know almost nine out of ten had a, um, a, a a successful cyber attack and then we follow up with this with, with the likelihood of you getting it in these three areas um, that you would have in the next 12 months you can see 70 percent feel somewhat likely to very likely that a customer record will be breached in the next 12 months 69% say somewhat likely to very likely of a um, data breach of your uh, a leakage of information assets, intellectual property, so 69%. And then the likelihood of your organization will experience a, one or more cyber attacks that infiltrate your networks are, is 78%, somewhat likely to very likely. Now, the good news is these numbers um, on the right-hand side actually dropped from the last uh, one. So people are feeling a little more um, positive about their ability to stop these, but still we're seeing, you know, between 70, you know, basically 70% to 78% uh, people feeling these attacks are going to continue. Now, we do ask, what are the top five data types at risk? So this would be as if, if you do have a successful breach, what types of data would be most harmful to be getting exfiltrated out of your organization? So number one is business communication, emails. Um, we're seeing this a lot when uh, with uh, attackers that are compromising um, uh, executive account email accounts and then using those accounts to send fraudulent emails to either victims, um, employees inside the organization or external partners that you may have uh, uh, that they do that. Human resource employee files. So obviously they're very everyone's concerned about getting your employee data exfiltrated. Um, that's a, a, a critical data piece uh, point to their businesses. Financial information. Um, yeah, obviously, you don't want your financial information to be leaked out there in the real world. Um, sometimes they do they do target those for uh, maybe to do if it's a public company, they may look to to uh, breach them so that they can get financial data, maybe an M and A uh, merger and acquisition data, uh, so that they could play play the stock the stock uh, uh, going up or down. They may leak some of that data, which then would obviously cause maybe the stock to drop, and they may be short it. Uh, R and D information uh, again, one of the top ones, uh, and then company confidential information um, rounds out the top five. The all of these data types obviously are very critical to a business. Um, and if they are breached, can cause some major damage to the brand or to the organization. Another question we ask is, what are the top five security risks in infrastructure uh, across the world? So first is negligent insiders. So how could my infrastructure be compromised? Well, if you have negligent insiders, this is where a, 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 an employee may not realize that they're Maybe if they're using chat GPT and they put some company confidential information in that training session, it gets out leaked out. Um, it may be somebody who, who misconfigures a uh, S3 bucket and opens it up to the internet and then the data within that bucket gets um, compromised. So certainly, you know, that's their number one risk is they feel in negligent insiders. Um, number two, cloud computing infrastructure and providers. We've been talking quite a bit um, over the last several years about the cloud environment. People are definitely adopting cloud quickly, and um, it is difficult to, to uh, secure because it's new technology for the organization. Many times they don't realize it. They're, they, they have to implement it quickly because they're being asked from the, from the executive to get that done, uh, and they may not, and it may open them up to some more risk because they don't understand it. Um, as part of the, the 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 number three mobile and remote employees, this has been on the list since 2020 when when uh, the pandemic hit, and as more uh, people started to had to shift to work from home, 
Um, so organizations definitely are still concerned about that. You still see more uh, work from home employees today than we, we've done in the past. Um, and it's going to continue. Uh, a lot of organizations are, are offering work from home as a, as a permanent option for their employees. So uh, this certainly is an area of concern. Shortage of qualified personnel. This one always makes this list. Um, the surveyees are definitely concerned about being able to hire people in the IT staff and, and InfoSec. Um, the lack of people that are available out there. Um, I think the last count was over 3 million openings in IT and InfoSec around the world. So certainly this is a, 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 a high risk area for them. And then virtual computing environments, servers and endpoints. We've been, again, we've been shifting to uh, um, public cloud infrastructure quite some time. All of that tends to be virtual computing environments. So they're definitely concerned about that as well. So these are the top five. And then we also ask, what are the top negative consequences of, a, of an attack? Um, first is disruption or damages to critical infrastructure. Um, certainly, businesses are dealing with ransomware and they and when ransomware hits it encrypts a lot of these um, systems and you're not able to utilize those systems or get access to the, the data the applications running there and so this is has been one of the top uh, risks out there for uh, the last several um, uh, runs that we did of the survey productivity decline so if there is an attack, and, and again, if your system isn't available, you can't do your work. Um, so they're concerned about productivity decline. Cost of outside consultants and experts. Um, certainly as you know, you don't, you may not have the expertise in-house to deal with a ransomware attack, for example. Uh, you may need to hire somebody to negotiate the ransom for you. Um, uh, you may need somebody to come in and do infant, uh, incident response for you because you may not have a, a robust incident response team. So, uh, and at all costs, um, certainly, and companies are concerned about that. So uh, that is obviously one there. Regulatory actions and lawsuits. Um, as part of this, we're seeing more organizations be targeted in, in uh, suits against them when they leak Unfortunately, breach get breached the, some of the customer data or company data, uh, so they end up that. And then reputation and brand damage rounds it out. Uh, obviously, if a successful breach happens and it's publicly um, made a, a, a aware of, uh, that the brand could certainly have a have a uh, get damaged as part of that. We wouldn't, we'd be remiss if we didn't ask about what types of threats are targeting your organization. And so these are the top five that um, organizations feel they are concerned about, uh, the surveys are concerned about. First is clickjacking. So clickjacking, if you're not familiar, clickjacking means that um, somebody gets a, an email or a, uh, a text and they click on the link and it takes them to a malicious site, potentially to download malware. Um, typically, employees are doing this more often, than, um, uh, and, and it can cause a problem. So like a, a phishing email comes in, and they click a link in the, in the email, and it compromises their account, and they get it, and it gains, uh, allows the attacker to gain access to the infrastructure. Business email compromise. Um, I don't know if you saw the uh, last year's uh, EC3 uh, report from the FBI, but um, ransomware was, the, was one of the top uh, I think it was number two after um, romance scams, number two, but it was in the billions of dollars in losses, uh, way more than ransomware. So uh, certainly a lot of organizations are concerned. We also are starting to see some of these malicious actors that were doing ransomware in the past, shifting a little bit more towards business email compromise um, because they are. it is a successful attack and it can garner quite a bit of, of revenue for them uh, per each attack. Tied with business email compromise or ransomware, certainly no surprise there. It's definitely a, a concern. It still is going to be a concern to people out there. Um, fileless attacks, uh, if you're not familiar with that, basically that means an attack that usually sits in memory. So it's it's not in a in a file on the system. It's sitting in memory. It's fileless. Uh, and that's um, sometimes is difficult for people to um, detect. Some of, the, some of the newer technology that's available can do this. Uh, but in many cases, if you're running older security products, you haven't enabled the latest uh, security uh, technologies, uh, this, this threat may get through. And last is botnets. Uh, certainly, um, 
Quackbot is one that's been in the news quite a bit lately. And uh, these botnets, uh, these botnet herders, we call them, the people that run the botnets uh, are, are being successful in utilizing uh, those as well. There's Mirai is a, is a botnet that targets IoT. Uh, and we see that um, happening around quite a bit. So those were the top five. Um, and there's about 20 plus ones that we asked the question about, but those were the top ones that, that they felt risk, the most risk. So, the, on, the, so on that, um, that was the global survey. So that's just the, some of the data that we provide around the global survey and what uh, the answers are. I wanted to shift and look at the North America ones. Um, because again, I um, uh, most of my audience uh, looking at, at um, geolocation is is hosted here, but I wanted to show you a little bit different view in in terms of what North America looks like. Because we break down all the different regions, we even break down to country level. Uh, but in North America, which is obviously U.S. and Canada, you can see as I, I I shared earlier on the lower left, you can see I've been running this one a lot longer. Uh, since, since 2018, you can see it's, it has been in the negative, which is an elevated risk level um, throughout. Uh, in the second half of 22, it was at minus 0 0.10. Uh, that is a increase from minus 0.33. But you see the lowest it ever got was minus 1.27. So it definitely shifted. You can see early in 2018, it went up a little bit, then down and went, kept going down and down. And then it, it it popped up and um but then it went down again and up again so certainly as as the threat landscape shifts and as people improve or are, are concerned about the preparedness capabilities you're going to see this number go up and down and fluctuate quite a bit but um you can see you know the global was at plus 0 0.01, but North America brought it down a little bit. Uh, that number wasn't as high as it could have been because North America was in the negative and had actually North America was the, the had the uh, highest risk level compared to all the regions out there. But if you want to look at some of the preparedness areas, um, uh, this is the one, question five was in the earlier one that I shared globally, but it's number one, it's the low, it's the highest risk according to North American respondents that the CEO and board of directors are not being, are not actively involved in overseeing their IT security function. Um, another, the second one, my organization's IT security function has evolved over time in response to changing attacks and attack patterns. So this is saying that it probably hasn't done that. Um, the IT security function has to evolve as, as threats evolve and as technology evolves. So this certainly is one of the higher risks that they're concerned about. Um, the third one, my organization spends considerable resources educating employees about security requirements. So again, this is here because they feel they aren't doing enough in that area. Maybe they don't have a security awareness training program uh, designed to help improve the employee's understanding of what cyber threats are targeting. Maybe they aren't doing phishing uh, simulations. Uh, so they're they're definitely concerned about that. And I would be concerned to hear as well because, you know, uh, employees are definitely going to be targeted more and more as as these actors target your 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 network. They'll go after your employees and trying to get in, you know, the initial access is going to be a typically a phishing email to your employees. So the more you can educate them, the more you're going to be, you're going to drop your risk associated with, uh, with getting attacked. Uh, number four, my organization is actively involved in threat sharing with other companies and governments. So U.S. feels that this, uh, that threat intelligence sharing is, is an area that they don't do well enough in. Um, Part of the challenges is that, you know, this is tends to be all over the place. Can you, you know, are there, you know, is there free feeds out there? Is there not free feeds? These are areas that um, a lot of businesses struggle with and organizations can struggle with because it is it is quite broad and there's and there's not a lot of, of, of places where you can uh, get information very easily and quickly. And then the last one, the security posture, my enterprise is secure for teleworkers. So we this is one we actually added uh, recently because of the work from home area, and they're definitely concerned about teleworkers or remote uh, work from home employees uh, security posture that that, you know, again, you don't own the the the, ne the home network, you don't own the, the devices inside the home network, and yet your employee is working in this home network environment, where obviously if something gets gets infected, 
not the 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 uh, uh, your your company laptop, but a, a device on your home network gets infected and it could spread to your your company device. And then if they go into the office or they log into the network, potentially can can allow the lateral movement there. I, I wanted to throw this one in. I didn't share this this information in the in the global one, but I wanted to show you the North America. This is showing the the biggest differences between the first half and the second half. Uh, differences and the um, the risk meaning it's higher in the second half than it was in the in the first half. So the first one is uh, question twelve. My organization spends considerable resources educating employees. So this actually they felt the risk. This is this is a higher risk now than it was in in the first half of the year. Um, the second one, my organization's IT has evolved over time. Again, this this one became a higher risk. Um, the security posture, teleworkers, higher risk. Uh, the my organization's IT security function complies with data protection and privacy requirements. That one had a higher risk. They felt it, that that area of their business was was worse off than than um, previous um, previous survey. And then we when we purchase security products, we buy tactically versus strategically. Uh, we have an issue and, and need a solution now. So what that what this one looks at is, are you looking long term or are you looking short term? Are you trying to apply band-aids to, to something and, and do a quick fix? Or are you looking long term on how do I solve that problem long term by maybe implementing some new technology or something? So that certainly they felt that actually was going down. So maybe they were looking at, at a two um too uh, early and 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 in the short term than thinking strategically out there, um, so that was there. And then this is where it actually got improved. So how did the um, the the threat actually risk improved over the last survey? Um, so they're enabling security technologies are sufficient to protect data assets and IT security uh, IT infrastructure. So overall, they felt that their their enabling service security technologies improved. So maybe they they update updated them quickly. They got some new technology through the updating those security. Maybe they bought some new security technologies that they implemented since the last survey. So they felt that this this um, this risk is lower now. Uh, my organization's IT security leaders report to senior leadership. So the good news there is maybe they've made some organizations have made some changes in the reporting structure. So now that um, the IT security leader is reporting to an exec to the CEO or COO, uh, where it may not have been in the past. So that's good news. That's a good trend we, we want to see. Uh, my organization's IT security function is quick to test and install all security patches. Uh, so maybe we're getting better at patch management here. And that's uh, that's a good news because it definitely needs that. Um, question 17, my organization's IT security function supports security in the DR and BCM environment. So they felt that was increasing. And the last one, uh, my organization makes appropriate investments in leading edge security technologies, such as machine learning, automation, orchestration, analytics, and or artificial intelligence. So they feel that that has actually improved. So they are making those investments, which is good. Um, we're starting to see, uh, for example, the large language models that are uh, Became came out recently with Chat GPT. Those are starting maybe to be implemented into the organization or into the security products. I know we are as a security vendor. We're looking at ways we can utilize this to improve our products and improve our processes as well. If we look at those same um, breach, how many times I got breached versus the likelihood of breach, you can see here in uh, on the left hand side uh, north america actually was higher than the than the other one you had 86% had uh, one or more data breaches involving customer records 31% had seven or more how many breaches of your of your ip 84% had one or more 37% had seven or more so that was higher from them globally and then how many separate cyber attacks? They had 78% had one or more and 34% had seven or more. So certainly North America uh, um, is dealing with this a little less effectively than the rest of the world. Uh, likelihood of your organization experience a customer record breach, 71%. Uh, it's almost similar. I think it was 70% in the last one. Um, likelihood that your organization will experience a data breach, it's 65% of intellectual property. We're somewhat likely to vary. Like I think this was 69% in the globally. So actually, the U.S. may be feeling a little more positive about this area. 
And then likelihood that your organization will experience one or more cyber attacks that have infiltrated your networks is 72%, somewhat to very likely. Um, so very similar to the global, but, but pretty close. If we look at the key takeaways, um, the, the top data types we talked about um, in globally, in, in the US, human resource files was number one. Um, customer accounts was number two. Business communication was number three. So you see business communication dropped from one and globally, it's in number three in, in North America. Company confidential was four. Financial information was five. On the right-hand side, you see this was from the previous one uh, in the first half we did. So you see it does flip and change. So financial information was number one last time, but now it, in this one, it's it's number five. Human resources went from number two to number one. Uh, business email uh, communication went from four to three. Uh, product market information and, and analytics actually fell out of the, the top five and was replaced by you know customer accounts and, and company confidential. So certainly that you know it's, it ebbs and flows here. On the in, on the five security risks to infrastructure, um, negligent insiders was number one, uh, which I think was the same in uh, the globally. Virtual computing environments was number two. Shortage of qualified personnel three. Mobile remote employees number four, and organization misalignment and complexity was number five. That's an interesting one. That one has actually been number one in the past. Um, Companies feel that they maybe have misaligned a little bit or the complexity of their infrastructure, their IT infrastructure is too much. Uh, they'd like to try to make it a little more simple. But you can see on the right-hand side, we, shortage of qualified personnel went from one to number three. Organization misalignment went from number two to number five. Virtual computing actually went from three to two. And cloud computing uh, was was uh, replaced by uh, what mobile, no, um, the uh, shortage of, no, which one am I missing here? Negligent insider, sorry, those popped in. Uh, and then mobile and remote employees went from five to four this time. So pretty, pretty consistent. Top five negative consequences of an attack in, in North America, customer turnover was their biggest concern. So certainly if they, they feel that maybe customers will, will drop them if they have a public uh, breach associated with you, but uh, that's um, certainly, you know, obviously a, a big concern by uh, if a breach happened. Productivity decline is number two. Cost of outside consultants and experts, number three. Reputation and brand damage, number four. And disruption or damages to critical infrastructure was number five. You can see on the right-hand side, you know, the cost of consultants was one last time. Now that's number three. Customer turnover went from number two to number one. Uh, lost intellectual property dropped out um, and productivity decline went up from five to number two. Disruption damage went from four to, to uh, five. And then on the threat side, this is interesting. You can see here in North America, phylus attack was number one. And the global survey was down, I think number three or four. Uh, actually, I think it was uh, four. And uh, man in the middle attack was number two. So again, you, you didn't you didn't see this one in the global, um, but certainly North Americans are concerned about man in the middle. Maybe because supply chain attacks, this tends to be uh, can be associated with a supply chain attack, which has been getting quite a bit of press, and we've seen a number of of uh, breaches caused by that. Malicious insiders, so not um, uh, negligent insiders, but malicious insiders. Uh, business email compromise is number four. And watering hole attacks is number five. So that wasn't in the global one. Watering hole is where an employee maybe go to a website and they and um, malicious actors have either taken over a legitimate website or they created a, a, a fraudulent website that would lure the employee into clicking on, into. Um, but you can see the difference between the first half and the second half. Um, a couple of those phishing and social engineering and was number two last time. It's not even in the top five this time, which is interesting because that tends to be a big one that that can cause problems. But uh, certainly this is uh, um, some interesting stuff. So um, if you want to, uh, we I have a, a dedicated page for this. So as as um, we continue to go across. Uh, and run these surveys, it will come up in this webpage, which is www.trendmicro.com slash cyber risk. 
There's also um, a calculate your own risk. So what we've done, we have an online survey where you can actually do the uh, a shortened version. You're not going to have to take all 136 questions and 10 following in the threat side. Um, so 46 questions total. We've cut it down um, significantly for you to take, uh, but still give you a, a, a good sense of where your score would be against these. Um, and we and we actually in the uh, when you calculate your risk, it'll give you your your CPI, your your cyber. Uh, uh, preparedness index. It'll give you your cyber threat index, and then it'll give you your cyber risk index. And you you can um, you can also get the the a report from us, which you can do will down you can download to your computer, and that will show you your risk compared to the global and regional ones. So you can see how you're doing against the global number as well as the regional numbers, uh, depending on which region you're in. Uh, but then also it will give you your answers to all of your questions. So you can take a look and see which ones you you maybe have, uh, have a higher risk versus lower risk. And then lastly, I, I give you uh, recommendations on, do, you know, at what level you're at, depending on your, your cyber risk level, um, elevated, you know, high, elevated, moderate or low. It gives you some guidance, some best practices and how you could improve your um, to en enable you to prove your score to get uh, maybe a, a better score next time. So let's talk about strategies for defending. Um, the first one is we re definitely recommend audit and inventory. There was that one question that was a high risk, which I don't know the physical location. So this is where you can take it. You know, you do need to figure out to do a discovery of your attack surface. We have some tools now with our um, Trim Micro One and Vision One that actually can do some some uh, uh, attacks uh, surface discovery for you. But take an inventory of those. Identify authorized and unauthorized devices and software. Make an audit of your uh, event and incident logs so that you can take a look at those. In many cases, some of these you can automate as well uh, using some of the newer technologies. But definitely, first and foremost, you have to know what you have. If you if you can't see it, you can't protect against it. That's the famous saying out there right now. So uh, certainly you want to do an attack surface discovery. Configure and monitor. <clears throat> so manage your hardware and software configurations, especially for cloud. We see um, one of the, the big reasons that cloud is getting compromised is because of misconfigurations. Uh, so you want to take, take a look at those. Grant admin privileges and access only when necessary to an employee's role. Um, so again, a lot of cases we see um, uh, the malicious actors are doing credential theft. Uh, they're trying to do brute force and so forth. So um, if if it doesn't, if that asset or that application doesn't, or that person doesn't need admin credentials, make sure they don't have it. Monitor your network ports, protocols, and services. I would say do this for your external facing systems, especially because that's where the criminals are going to first target your organization. They're going to look for all of your open IPs on the internet using say Shodan, and it'll tell them what ports are open, what protocols are running, uh, what services are running. And they'll be able to take advantage of that, and maybe compromise. Activate your security configurations on network infrastructure devices, such as firewalls and routers. Um, again, this is an area that you wanna make sure you have the latest and greatest technology running. Um, and you've enabled all of the, the, the advanced threat detection capabilities. Establish a software allow list that only executes legitimate applications. In many cases, there are systems in your organization that you could do a um, allow list. And so only allow those applications to run. So if anything tries to get on there, for example, a ransomware file, uh, it would block it from, from uh, executing because it's not authorized and it can't do it. So it, in any place where you can do that, it's probably a good idea to try to do that. A patch and update. Uh, this is a, a, a main area. We talked about patch management. One of the things I do recommend here is if you're familiar with CISA, they publish a known exploitable vulnerability database called KEV. It's a catalog of uh, that you can sub, you can get on and actually download a, a CSV file that has all of the CVEs that are being that are knowingly being uh, exploited in the wild today. And those there's about 900 plus of those in that in that uh, in that database. Those are certainly ones that you want to look at if you're running any of those in your organization and you haven't patched yet, you absolutely need to patch them. So taking that risk-based approach to patch management, I know, you know, 
for example, um, MITRE last year, I think they published 28,000 plus CVEs. Certainly, there's no way you can patch that many CVEs. And in and fact, you're not running all of those, obviously, So because those are all of them. But you can whittle down that number by knowing what you're running inside your organization, what applications, what operating systems, uh, so forth. And so you can you can then figure out which ones you're actually using. And then, and then you use that KEV to see what ones are actively being exploited in the wild. Um, also look for alerts when uh, for like like the log for J1 last year that got exploited very quickly. Uh, anytime a new uh, uh, patch comes out, the criminals are going to look at that patch and see is that something I can take advantage of, and so they they look to exploit those. So um, perform that. You can also implement some IPS, which is a virtual patching option. Uh, virtual patching can help you um, in terms of uh, blocking an exploit from running on uh, executing against that vulnerability and with a virtual patch so that you can take your time to test to make sure the patch that is available is ready to go and then apply that patch at some point. <clears throat> Protect and recover. So implement data protection, backup, and recovery measures. So we recommend the three, two, one backup model. So three backups, two, uh, two separate mediums, and one offline that is not able to get accessed by the criminals. They are going to target your storage um, system or to storage files and try to encrypt those as part of a ransomware attack, for example. Enable multi-factor authentication is a big one um, if you want for especially for your administrator accounts and any database accounts, accounts that access your, your critical data, those should all have some type of multi-factor authentication associated with them. Because even if they do steal your username password or they brute force the password, they still don't get access to that multi-factor authentication. Now, one of the things I would recommend, um, we just went through this with our security awareness training. Uh, we did a MFA bombing uh, test inside our organization. We found a number of people that fell for that. Um, that should start being becoming part of your security awareness training is actually running an MFA bombing uh, um, uh, simulation to see if your employees know it. And, and also as part of your security awareness training, explain what MFA bombing is and how to protect against it. You know, if you have an employee that gets, you know, multiple MFA, um, uh, 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 MFA requests to them in a very short period of time, it's probably an MFA bombing. So they should ignore those, hopefully. Secure and defend, right? Employ sandboxing. So if you can run sandboxing capability, you can, you know, that maybe for attachments that are coming in an email, you send them to a sandbox, let them check out. Files that are being downloaded from the from the uh, web, you could sandbox and have them run in a sandbox and make sure that they are uh, they are doing uh, legitimate stuff. And if they do bad stuff, then you block it and don't let that that file through. Um, deploy the latest versions of security solutions to all layers. Uh, um, this is an area where you want to look at and, and maybe doing an audit with your security vendor. I definitely recommend as part of your uh, regular training here is that you engage your security vendor, make sure they take a look at the products that they're using, that you're using inside your network and let them do an audit and see, hey, is it running, the, are you running the latest version of the software? Do you have all the security controls enabled that, that and especially the advanced ones, maybe they were published with, a, they were put in there, but disabled by default. You need to enable those and they maybe they protect you from the next threat. Detect early signs of an attack, such as uh, um, suspicious tools. Living off the land tools are big. Um, uh, we just saw an alert from uh, uh, about some China group that is using living off the land binaries inside uh, critical infrastructure accounts. And so those are things that you need to uh, monitor and assess. Am I Because they're going to use the same tools that you use inside your account. So you got to be able to determine, are they legitimate uses of that tool? Or is it an illegitimate use of that tool? And then use the advanced technologies again. This is part of that audit with your, with your security vendor. Do you have the latest thing uh, enabled? And then train and test. Regularly train and assess your employees. That security awareness training program I mentioned, you need to implement that. Don't do it just in October, which is security awareness month. Do it on a regular basis with your employees. And then conduct red team exercises, pen testing. Make sure your incident response plan is, is ready and available and you're regularly testing it. If you don't have one, definitely need to get one. 
Um, also, if you're struggling with um, a, a shortage of, of skilled personnel, think about a managed version uh, or go to a, a managed um, uh, uh, MSP uh, potentially type of, uh, of uh, option for you. We have a um, our managed detection and response uh, service that we offer. Um, and it can be go through the partner, go through you directly. Uh, and our trained personnel who are doing this day in and day out, they've been doing it for years, they're trained to threat hunt and they can do it inside your organization through the products that you're running. So a managed service might be something to think about. Uh, and lastly, you know, I talk about attack surface risk management. This is this is where we are evolving to as a industry. You're doing more on the attack surface today. In the past, it was always siloed products that detected a threat and then and, and popped it into a log. You had to go through all those alerts and figure out which ones are working. Today, with the advanced platform approach that we have, you're able to actually have the AI and ML and machine language that is built into it now can actually take all of those alerts and identify which ones are critical and bubble the critical ones up to where you actually have to deal with that. So of a, maybe a, you have a thousand a day. Now you've whittled it down to one or two actually that are very concerning that you have to take action upon. The other 995 or 98, you're, we're already taken care of, for example. You don't have to bother with it. Uh, I mentioned our roadshow. Uh, Feel free if uh, we may be coming to a city near you. Like I said, it's a 200, 120 plus cities. Uh, I was just in Orange County yesterday doing one uh, or on Wednesday doing one. I'm going to be in Raleigh next week and I'm going to be in Chicago. I'll be in Seattle. All of these are upcoming ones. You can take a look. You can see the cities here, um, the Orange County one. But we got Detroit, Raleigh, Montreal, Chicago, Palo Alto, many, you know, uh, uh, and we're going to talk about risk to resilience. We're going to talk risk. How does it help you? So that's all I had today. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free. Um, somebody asked, can you please elaborate on the virtual computing environments, top uh, security risk? So virtual computing certainly is an area that um, organizations have been uh, adopting. So, in, you know, VMware was the original where you had um, VMware was, uh, whether it was on a server, a, a virtual server, or a virtual desktop, a lot of organizations are shifting to those. And so uh, they're concerned about it because, again, it may be some, some newer technology. It may be something that could be compromised, and they don't have a good handle on the security aspects. The, the the threat actors take a look at that again they'll they'll look they'll they'll map out your network and they'll identify you know if you have a virtual environment am I able to access it or not you know one of the things I noticed in this lay at last uh, CISA alert about the critical infrastructure organizations being targeted by uh, Chinese actors they mentioned that the Chinese actors were doing intelligence gathering. One of the things that they may be doing here is they're just accessing trying to get access to the to the uh, system, the networks inside these critical infrastructure uh, providers and not doing any damage, not doing any uh, um, disruption. They're just trying to learn how can I, what can I access inside this network? How can I access the network? What could I do? Maybe I, maybe I uh, do something, get access to a, a uh, industrial IoT device and I, and I stop it for a second and turn it back on. But then they, they leave the, the, the network and they erase their tracks. You don't, don't even know that they were ever in there, but it was all to educate them on what they could do in the next attack against the organization. So certainly um, virtual computing environments are gonna be around for a long time and they're probably growing. Uh, because you can do more with a virtual environment instead of having a physical um, device at everybody that you, you, you implement virtual uh, uh, infrastructure. So they're just concerned about it. Uh, let's see. I don't think I had anything else here. Um, oh, might have you. Oh, got to thank you. So yeah, no worries about that. I appreciate it. Um, well, listen, I'm going to, if there's no one else have any questions or anything, I will let you go. But um, quick update, my June uh, 
monthly threat webinar, I'm going to have a featured speaker, uh, a, a researcher who has been researching the uh, chat GPT and large language models, so AI. We're going to talk about AI in the June one. So look forward to seeing that uh, invite. Hopefully you can join me then. It'll be towards the end of June. Uh, but uh, we're going to be talking everything AI. So how do you use AI positively, but also how are the threat actors going to target the, the use of AI and use it to target organizations? So it'll be a really good and fun uh, uh, webinar. I, I, I think you'll enjoy it. So uh, with that, everybody, thank you very much. Have a great day and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.